Hey everybody, I'm Sunday from FBN and I'm here today with Jonathan Lawler, the punk rock farmer. And I'm so excited to talk to you today. Um, I feel like I have a bazillion questions for you, just learning about your operation and, and what you do out there. Uh, so you have an operation called Brandywine Creek Farms out in Indiana. And uh, so let's talk about it a little bit. Uh, you know, tell me a little bit about your operation and, uh, you know, for some backstory, I know that you transitioned from a traditional operation to a nonprofit one. So uh, give us an overview of that. So yeah, uh, prior to 2015, we were Lawler Farms. We were just a commercial vegetable producer uh, uh, doing wholesale vegetable crops. Um, and uh, my son came home from school and was talking about uh, there was hungry kids at his school. Uh, there were kids that were taking food home from a pantry and I didn't understand what he meant. I was like, you, you have a pantry at your school. And he was like, yeah, we have a pantry. And one of my friends was taking food home from it. And I was like, that can't be right. So I looked into it, you know, it was like winter time. And I just got lost in food insecurity and hunger in the United States, trying to wrap my head around how, you know, number one, Indiana is known for its agricultural you know, prowess, how, how, you know, we're, we're, we're one of the big states for ag. Um, so why are there hungry people here? Uh, and then why there's hungry people in the United States? I mean, the United States is responsible for feeding the world. Um, and you know, there's, there's folks in our own backyards that are suffering and that just didn't sit right with me. So I told my wife, we were going to plant the farm again this year but I had just sold a trucking company. We had some money. Um, and I said, I just want to give away the harvest to anybody who will take it. Uh, doing more research. My idea of a hungry person up until that point, you know, Indianapolis is 27 miles uh, east of me. And I, I assumed that a hungry person was a homeless person that lived under a bridge in Indianapolis. I did not know that the hungry people were actually intermingling around us, that there were people that might have jobs, but when they get home, they don't know where their next meal is coming from, or children at school that don't know where their next meal is coming from. We don't have famine in the United States the way other countries do. We just have a problem with, with hunger. Uh, and in my and I've been doing this now for five years, delving into food insecurity. We, you know, my, my thoughts have evolved that, you know, hunger in the United States is always a symptom of something else. Uh, so what, so what we've been able to do is we have been able to use our free food as a, you know, as a bridge to folks that normally don't want to talk about problems or talk about what's going on in their lives. And, you know, we use that food to open up the lines of communication. Um, and that allows us to seek out the help they need. Um, we're really good at treating that symptom of hunger. But, you know, Brandywine Creek Farms mission, the Pug Rock Farmers mission is to go beyond treating symptoms and actually get to the cure. So and, and we're always going to have hungry folks. But the more that we get out of that line, the easier it is for us to, to treat more folks. And plus it, it's better, you know, if you have the opportunity to lift somebody completely up out of where they're at, you know, and, and, and in all honesty, it's not us actually doing it. It's typically them. It's just, they need that shoulder for a second to lean on because they're in a bad place yeah. and we help them do that. So that, that yeah. that's what we do. Yeah. That's so awesome. I, in talking with you a little bit um, beforehand, uh, your sort of definition of punk is really interesting as we had sort of gone back and forth about are the cramps punk. Um, so maybe talk to a little bit about that. I, I think that you have a unique sort of take on it, not just musically, but just in general when it comes to farming and when it comes to your philosophy. Well, I mean, I've always, I mean, you know, in the world of agriculture, you know, it, it's, uh, there is a stereotypical image of a farmer. Um, and I'm not it, you know, at least typically not from like my belt up. It, you know, it, it's kind of funny that uh, when I went, how I actually got my name, the punk rock farmer, is I had a group of inner city kids that were 
fascinated uh, by my long hair. I have my hair in my hat right now, but by my long hair, I was wearing a Misfits shirt um, with the sleeves cut off. But I also have Love on, the Misfits. Yeah, I had Cardart jeans on and I had Justin boots on. I'm driving a big diesel pickup truck, pulling a big tractor. And I was listening to punk music. And so all these kids started calling me the punk rock farmer. And the name stuck, you know, the community leader started using it and a reporter wrote about it. And from there, the, the, the name stuck. And um, I never actually, I was never one of those people that you would like point at and go, oh man, I mean, I never had the mohawk. I, you know, I, I am so punk rock that I don't have tattoos. I mean, <laughs> I don't, I, it was just never something that I was into. And I actually had somebody when they met me go, I can't believe you don't have any tattoos. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, no, I don't. Um, <laughs> it, it was just one, and it, it was just one of those, it was one of those things that gave me the opportunity to, to cross uh, certain lines in agriculture. Um, you know, the same, the, the, it's like, uh, and once once farmers actually hear what I'm talking about and, and and see what I'm about, they understand that I'm actually on their side. I mean, I get side eyed by a lot of farmers. We we, we do a uh, we we have a film project, and we've had some people that are like, we don't want you to come film here because we think you're probably activists. Because of course, the punk rock farmer is an activist, and I, I'm I'm not. I'm an activist for agriculture. I mean, that's for sure. I mean, I don't even like to call myself an advocate. You know, the the advocates. I call myself an advocatist, and it's on the side of these men and women who are constantly toiling to bring everybody their daily bread. And the misinformation that surrounds our industry is phenomenal. And so, I use the punk rock farmer as a way to to. Uh, bridge that gap, get outside of the echo chamber that seems to be that seems to be in agriculture and just really, you know, talk to talk to the general public, um, yeah. you know, and, and that that's and, and being punk. I tell people all the time, my, my father in law is one of the most punk dudes I know. You know, he is like an old school pastor. And I mean, he's a farmer. Uh, but he does the things that he thinks are right, no matter what, yeah. you know, he, he, he is a, he is just like a beacon of an individualist that's going to do what he thinks is the right thing to do um, and go out of his way to help other people. You know, yeah. it's inspiring. And when I see that, that, that to me, that's more punk than, than putting on leather jackets and, you know, running a mohawk <laughs> in your hair. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's great. And and a great definition, I think, of just sort of um, you know, what what is current and what is trendy may not be the thing that is actually needed and helpful for folks. So yeah. I haven't heard, I haven't heard any new punk that I would associate with the music that I listen to. And and that's yeah. the other thing. I list I grew up, you know, the, the way I grew up, I I listen to country music. I listen to you know, I listen to a lot of metal. I mean, punk is something that I always, believe it or not, punk was something I, I listened to to make myself feel better because mm -hmm. punk is always more upbeat than anything else. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I, 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 I guess I, I associated with that and, you know, but I want, I, I want people to know that everybody can be a punk rock farmer. I mean, I don't want this to be like, oh, you're the punk rock farmer. Nobody else should try to you know get on your style no we need we need more people doing whatever they think is going to help society move forward you know mm -hmm. whether it's popular or not that's what that's that that is the definition of punk in my book so yeah and and sort of on that note uh i have heard that you have turned down some really lucrative speaking opportunities on talk shows um and uh can you give us a, an insight into the reason behind that yeah, I, well, I, I got a call from Rachel Ray's producer, and I'd like to tell you that I just turned her down because I, because I was busy or I had something even better than that. I didn't know who Rachel Ray was when they called. <laughs> you, uh, I you know who was, and when I got the phone, I talked to my wife. She freaked out, and I was like, "Well, I told her I can't do it." Um, 
we got a call from one of Ellen's producers and I actually had a meeting that was about helping uh, provide produce to kids after school. Mm-hmm. Only meal they were getting were their breakfast in school and their lunch in school. And they had nothing when they left and went home. Um, and I honestly just, my mindset was, you know, yeah, that's, that, that's great that, that her show called and whatever, um, you know, half the time those things, whether they help you or not, but I had immediate needs right then and there with, with these kids. Yeah. Uh, so I, I mean, I just, I listed what is my prayer. I mean, how, what a poser would I be if I said, sorry, kids, <laughs> Ellen just called or, or whoever. <laughs> exactly. The work has to stop. Yeah. I, I can't help you now. I mean, that that's, that's, and, and you know what, I'm glad that I, I did that because this the opportunities that I have had um, to actually meet people that, well, to meet from a celebrity standpoint, to meet celebrities that I actually really am, you know, impressed by. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've, I've always loved Hendrix Motorsports, and I was actually honored to be, uh, you know, their guest and actually sit in the pits and watch a Brickyard 400. I mean, yeah. I met Jeff. I, I met I met a bunch of drivers, you know, because I am a NASCAR. I'm not as much as a NASCAR fan as I used to be, but you know, it's still being able to meet some of the older guys. I met Clint Boyer, which is was huge for me. And then, and if I'm honest, Clint Boyer and Jeff Gordon are higher on my list than Ellen. Rachel and- Ray. <laughs> you're you're not into uh, the nutrition, or I forget. No, what no. And that, and- I, I, I was able to shoot a commercial with uh, Craig Culver from Culver Restaurants. Um, mm-hmm. You yes, know, I Culver. Yeah, I did a commercial for Tyson Foods and was like treated. I mean, Tyson rolled out the red carpet for for me and my family, and they, you know, they didn't have to. We just shot a commercial, and they they just. I mean, I was able to meet, you know, John Tyson, and, and that's the thing with all the. You know, corporations are one thing, but then the individuals in the corporations are a whole nother thing. And yep. individual, and that's the thing. And this isn't a popular opinion, but the individuals that I met at Tyson, that company, you know, those those people were nothing but the most wonderful people I've ever met. I mean, and they still like reach out to me and still want to know how it's going and, and, and things like that. Yeah. So Tyson's gotten a bad rap because the last couple of things that have happened with them, I guarantee you is not their company culture because I've experienced their company culture. Um, yeah. And that, that's just, and, you know, my, my 16 year old son got to meet, you know, I believe it's John Tyson, you know, the, the grandson of the guy who founded it and he's their chairman of the board. I think they're the second largest food company on the planet. And my son was just like not impressed by him. And he totally dug that, that he, was able to communicate with my son on, on, on a level of not being starstruck. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But that, that's, that's, it's been a, it's been a wild trip, but at the same time, you know, th- those opportunities that have presented themselves have been, they've been great. Yeah. My, yeah. By the, way, the best is the best that I've ever, I did an entire show with Mike Rose. Yeah. A day, and he was absolutely, and he is the real deal. Well, and when the cameras aren't rolling, he's even better. He's even better when the cameras aren't rolling. He is more real. So (laughs) that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah, Awesome. Uh, So, so sort of, I know you had mentioned uh, your sons, are they into punk music at all? Or do they even play any punk music or anything like that? So my son is really into like the new outlaw country music that's out right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, like Way Jennings and um, he's going to get mad if I butcher some of these guys and I like them too but I I don't know their names or you know uh, like Way Jennings and um, Coulter Wall is mm-hmm. is one uh, that he, they like but he, him and his friends are like trying to put together that style of band right now uh, yeah that'd be old, awesome old, old school country um, 
you know, and my 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 youngest son, my oldest son is into rap music, which it would be okay if it was like real rap music, but it's this crap that they're playing today. <laughs> Not that great. Um, He's gonna watch this and just oh, yeah. shake his head. <laughs> I, I, some of the like the old school gangster rappers that I listened to in high school, and he. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's more into the, the 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 new stuff, and then my youngest son is just an avid Leonard Skinner fan, old Southern rock, um, classical rock. He's into. He does not like punk music because mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean he likes the, you know, he can tell you every ACDC album, every ACDC song. He's just not the same. They're they're all different, which. I'd actually prefer they all have, have different personalities than be all the same. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the individuality, I think. When you have a kid, you sort of get a person. You roll the dice, you get a person. What kind of person? Right, <laughs> right. Know? That's so funny. Well, that's awesome. Um, so I guess, you know, as a sort of final question, what has been a hot topic for FBN and what we've been really looking at across the country for our farmers is uh, the conditions out there. How has 2021 treated you out on the farm uh, with your produce and everything like that? So I always, I always preface it with, you know, I am subsidized by private funders to give food away. So mm -hmm. I don't want people to look at what I do and say, um, that, to use me as an example, because they shouldn't. Now we do have a side that is a wholesale side. Mm. Our, our, our season, um, our season, I was actually injured uh, on the farm uh, July 3rd and I'm not back to a hundred percent yet. Uh, I'm not allowed to like lift over 25 pounds. Um, but I, <laughs> that sucks. Yeah. I, I, a lot of tractor work uh but yeah our our season uh just overall our biggest issue has been labor um we we haven't been i mean our farm has suffered the most because as a produce farmer we are very labor intensive yep and yep we got you know just the the you know between my wife my wife basically runs a nonprofit um along with our board she's a lot of the admin mm -hmm. uh and me and my my oldest son's in college and my two other sons, three guys can't take care of this. And we have had, and, and, and the thing is, I keep hearing, well, if you pay well, well, we do pay well. Yeah. We can't. Um, yeah. So that, that has been the hardest thing for us. Um, I had a tractor sitting with a part. I, I had a tractor sit. It just got picked up today. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. um, they, they don't have the parts for it and I don't, they don't know when they're going to have the parts for it. And that tractor has been sitting for almost, you know, three weeks, not able to function on the farm. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's been an interesting year. Um, we're, we are, we have pivoted. Uh, we're going to, we're very diversified right now. We grow tomatoes, peppers, watermelons, uh, cucumbers. We are pivoting next year to two tomato crops and watermelon. <laughs> all growing so uh, our scale as a watermelon farm is going to you know almost quadruple ramp up a lot yeah yeah but at the same time we just look at it from the sense of it's easier for us to manage if we're only having to deal with one crop coming in on at one time and that's the other thing people don't understand with produce i mean our like we grow kale i mean yeah when we grow kale we grow you know 30 900 foot long 36 on 36 inches rows of kale um and that stuff has to be picked every day yeah has to be. and you know it's one of those things that you know we're going away from that because kale is ready in june mm, and so yeah we're, we start harvesting kale in june um you know there there there's other i mean we start harvesting zucchini in mid-june mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're good. We're just getting away from that only because, you know, I look at, 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 from a nutritional standpoint, I am still giving away produce, watermelons and tomatoes, plus our, our beef operation. Um, those three things. And we do, we donate, we donate protein. Um, yeah. that th those are all high nutrition. Um, yeah. yeah. you know, and they're very simple, you know, a tomato does not require cooking. A watermelon does not require cooking, you know, yep. zucchini, slice it up and 
Yeah. We grow zucchini. We grow, we grow, I mean, mo- I would hope most people eat kale cooked. I mean, I can't eat it at all, but. Oh, really? Not at all? Even oh, no, with I, a little lemon juice to make it softer? I despise kale as one of those. <laughs> I mean, people always, I mean, because I don't spray kale. I don't mm-hmm. spray it. And people are like, oh, because you're you you want to make sure that it doesn't have any pesticides. It's like, no, because I don't care enough about it as a crop. <laughs> you just have a personal distaste for nothing, it. Nothing only I've ever seen eating my kale is deer. And the weird part about it is I grow collard greens right next to it. And we have to spray those constantly for cabbage moths. Mm. But we cannot spray there's a there's a dark truth in that kale. Something's going on out there with kale. I want to I want to get to the bottom of this. Yeah. Well, I, well, you know, I really don't like it when it's really um, the stems get really hard. I mean, that's when, you know, it's maybe sat too long in the field is when those stems get really hard. It's like if I wanted to eat a tree, I just would. So that's yeah, would. Exactly. <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm I'm hoping one day a recipe falls in your lap, at least I can get that <laughs> kale prepared better for you. But um, anyways, that's that's good to know. But I mean, it's interesting just changing up your operation. You really have to think about the end user in your case so what right. they can use the most so there's a cat coming in into the frame here um anyways awesome um well i, I want to wrap it up you know just by encouraging everybody to give you a follow on facebook and instagram at the punk rock farmer um it's easy to search and just sort of following your journey and and your mission i think it's super interesting and also just awesome. I don't know. I mean, you you hear a lot about farming with a purpose, but uh, this is like truly farming with a purpose from start to finish. So uh, I really appreciate you talking with us today. Hey, I really appreciate it too. Thank you so much. Yeah, awesome. And I'm glad my cat made a final <laughs> uh, scene stealing moment, but yeah, it was great. <laughs> right.